In my last few videos, we have talked kind of extensively about the carbon cycle and the current perturbation of the carbon cycle, which we call climate change. Um, and I have been talking a little bit more about modern climate change compared to my uh, normal kind of ancient history climate change topics. And, um, you know, we kind of talked in the last one about how the greenhouse effects works and how carbon in the atmosphere increases the temperature of Earth. Um, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about how exactly and in what ways we know that the current increase in atmospheric carbon is due to humans. So <laughs> let's get started. So like I mentioned in the previous videos, we kind of went over how the carbon cycle works and how increasing carbon dioxide and other constituents in the atmosphere causes warming through the greenhouse effect. And the major questions I want to answer through this video are how do we know that the increase in carbon dioxide is man-made? And two, how does the relatively small amount of carbon dioxide that we input to the atmosphere compared to other natural systems affect global climate? How does that you know, comparatively small amount or seemingly small amount really cause global climate change at a level that we should be worried about. So first things first, how do we know that the carbon increase is due to us? Well, one way is timing. Obviously, correlation is not causation. There's many other pieces of evidence I will go through, but one thing that seems pretty obvious is if we look at the time scale, you know, and pre-industrial versus post-industrial times and years throughout Earth's history and, and just how much, you know, more carbon and carbon compounds are, are, are present in the atmosphere, not just carbon compounds, but nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases as well. And um, yeah, yeah, there's uh, the timing is pretty... <laughs> pretty obvious. Um, that's, that's just one. Two, tracking the amounts of fossil fuels we burned. So we can actually track based on how much we've burned uh, exactly how much carbon should be uh, increasing in the atmosphere, or how much the atmospheric carbon content should be increasing by um, year to year based on our annual emissions. And, um, and and we do that and and we can see that it matches what we're emitting. So yeah, the increase in carbon dioxide and other carbon compounds in the atmosphere matches the amount that we are burning. So therefore it would make sense that um, that is that is from us. And the third reason, my favorite reason that we know it's us, is isotopes. Um, I've talked about this concept in my carbon isotope and radioactive versus stable isotope videos, but essentially there are three isotopes of carbon that exist. Isotopes are just different forms of kind of the same element in nature. The only difference between them is their number of neutrons. Obviously they are all carbon because their number of protons stays the same, but their number of neutrons changes. Carbon 12 containing six neutrons, carbon 13 containing seven, and carbon 14 containing eight. Uh, and these isotopes are important and useful for we're tracking what carbon goes where because they fractionate or they behave differently than each other when it comes to their transfer through different systems on Earth. In other words, for example, when it comes to algae or plants or any photosynthesizing organisms that take carbon from the atmosphere, they preferentially take up light carbon or carbon with less neutrons, carbon-12, over carbon-13. And this leads to a very carbon-12 rich signature of obviously fossil fuels because those are primarily made up of ancient organic carbon deposits that were produced by ancient, you know, like algal blooms and other photosynthetic type of life that built up organic carbon in either a marine or swampy area that led to carbon deposits that became fossil fuels that, that we use um, to burn and, and make energy. The reason this is important and creates a unique signature is because other types of carbon containing rocks and carbon deposits like inorganic carbon deposits such as limestone do not do any preferential fractionation of carbon isotopes. Therefore, their signature is much more rich in carbon-13 compared to fossil fuel signatures of carbon. Therefore, when we release the carbon into the atmosphere, uh, we can very much tell that it's got the carbon-12 rich signature of fossil fuels. We know that the current emissions or increases in atmospheric carbon 
are, are due to us emitting it because they are clearly from fossil fuel deposits based on their isotope content. Um, but another isotope that's really helpful in this signature identification scenario is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is radioactive isotope of, of uh, carbon. In other words, it decays over time, unlike carbon-12 and 13, which are stable isotopes and do not decay over you know, time scales that are useful for us. And so carbon-14, because it decays relatively quickly on geological time scales is really completely absent from the ancient fossil fuel deposits that we burn because it's all decayed it's all gone um, so because of this the other important signature of the carbon re-release is that it's completely depleted in carbon-14 and so this is creating a very unique atmospheric carbon isotope trend that we can track based on how much we know it should be becoming depleted in carbon-14 and enriched in carbon-12 based on how much we're releasing. And what do you know, it matches with the scenario that we are causing the increase in carbon in the atmosphere because of the exact match between how much the carbon-12 is increasing and how much the carbon-14 is decreasing based on what we are emitting, what types of isotopic carbon we are emitting. So in other words, the atmospheric carbon we're releasing has an isotope signature and we can track it and we can tell what is us versus what is natural. Um, and, and it's very simple to do with isotopes and, and very obvious. <laughs> That's why I love this method. Another way that we can tell that carbon in the atmosphere is increasing. This is not This is less of a way that we can tell that it's us and more just a way that we can tell how much the carbon is increasing um, and then indirectly tell that, you know, that's based on how much we've released um, because essentially this is just oxygen decline. Remember in recent videos, I've talked about the relationship between the carbon and oxygen cycles and also the reaction that is required in burning fossil fuels, which is essentially the use of oxygen, the presence of oxygen, which reacts with the organic carbon burns it, oxidizes it, and converts it to CO2. This obviously uses up oxygen because this process involves oxygen, and this oxygen decline that we are observing in the atmosphere and oceans today matches with what we'd expect based on what we've burnt, what we, what the fossil fuels we've burnt. So uh, this is one other way that we can, we can tell how the carbon and oxygen cycles are being affected and kind of quantify that as well for relating the oxygen decline back to the carbon increase. Um, I should disclaim here that it's obviously not quite that simple because <laughs> there are places where oxygen is increasing. There's places where oxygen is decreasing. It's the same story when it comes to global warming. Obviously, the globe doesn't warm evenly throughout you know, the entire global surface. Some places are cooling or have cooled in the recent years and some are warming at much faster rates than others. And so it's, it's um, obviously not like a one singular trend everywhere on earth um, but when you run you know the global models and look at the global observations and measurements and data and put that all together you can get a pretty good picture of kind of an average decrease of oxygen in these different systems and get an idea of, of why that is and the fifth and final reason that we know the atmospheric carbon increase is due to us is, uh, well, we can run climate models. And no, I'm not talking about predicting the future through climate models as shown here on the left. I'm actually talking about models like shown here on the right, which predict the present. Uh, it turns out that when we run models that only take into account natural carbon cycle effects, they don't match our current observations of temperatures and conditions on Earth. They do not match data, meaning that there's something that's missing from the model. So then when we go back and add human factors, human input of carbon and other things into the atmosphere, we see that the observations and the actual model when taking into account human factors as shown here by the black line and blue band respectively match. They match when the model takes into account humans. Therefore, to get to our present day scenario, there is no model that can do so without taking into account human factors. Thus, we are affecting global climate one way or the other. You know, there's just no model that can do that without taking us into account. And our second question is how does the relatively small amount of carbon dioxide that we are inputting into the atmosphere affect global climate? 
Well, essentially, the carbon cycle is a cycle, right? It goes into the atmosphere and it goes out of the atmosphere. And there are different processes that kind of control this cycle. We've talked about that in the recent videos about biogeochemical cycling, including the carbon cycle. However, in our current carbon cycle scenario, our human input of a relatively small amount compared to the normal natural annual input of carbon into the atmosphere and out of the atmosphere, um, our input is kind of what is pushing the atmospheric CO2 input a little bit over the edge to the point that it throws the cycle off of balance uh, toward the warming side of things. Now again, this isn't like this hasn't happened throughout Earth's history due to natural causes or other organisms or whatever might have caused that. The cycle has been pushed off of balance in both the warming and the cooling direction many times throughout Earth's history. It's just that the rate at which we're doing this, the rate at which we're increasing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, is very fast and and that's the part and I've said this in so many recent videos that is the part it, that is uh, dangerous and and harmful for life and causes mass extinctions is when the rate of change is very quick on geologic time scales the magnitude matters but not as much as rate uh, when it comes to causing major mass extinctions through climate change. Um, but even this number of atmospheric carbon dioxide input due to humans of 10 gigatons of carbon is very small compared to what uh, is actually going into the entire kind of surface earth system from our burning of fossil fuels and other activities because this is just representing what we're inputting to the atmosphere not even counting what's getting absorbed by the oceans and the biosphere and like i talked about in my recent atmosphere video where i talked about residence time of gases in the atmosphere and all that i talked about how the carbon cycle is interesting in that it cycles through the atmosphere hydrosphere and biosphere or air water and life much much faster than it goes back into the geosphere. And so because we're taking it from the geosphere, from the rocks, and we're putting it into the atmosphere and water and biosphere system, uh, this is leading to a much a bigger increase in this relatively fast carbon cycle system um, compared to obviously the geospheric system, which is throwing the cycle off of balance essentially. So this atmospheric number, which seems relatively small, is misleading compared to the actual amount that we're increasing increasing uh, carbon in the atmosphere, oceans, and biosphere before we can finally bring it back to balance and, and get it back into the geosphere. Because that process just takes so much longer for it to cycle back to, to the geosphere. In other words, it's immediate for us to convert organic carbon rocks to CO2 and release it into the atmosphere, whereas it takes millions of years for those rocks to reform. So <laughs> it's just it's just an imbalance in, in the cycle. And when we take Take it from the geosphere it just is uh, harder to find that balance again or, or not harder it takes a longer time i should say and currently humans globally get about 80 percent of our energy from fossil fuels oil gas and coal which obviously releases carbon to the atmosphere only about six percent nuclear six percent hydro and uh the last one percent are things like wind, solar, etc. But I will dive more into this and, and discussing alternative energies and their potential pros and cons and impact in a future video I think I'm going to try and do. So look out for that coming soon in the coming weeks probably. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and are enjoying my more uh, climate related videos. I always am reluctant to talk about this, but again, the class I'm teaching is very climate related and maybe since I'm a doctor now, I'll get less hate about it. Um, but <laughs> in any case, I can't wait to see you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you guys have a good one. Bye.